Good morning and a very warm welcome to all the attendees who have uh, already joined us and uh, uh, as I talk through the initial part of the webinar I, we expect that uh, many more attendees will uh, be joining us uh, pretty shortly. Uh, so very happy to uh, get another edition of the Global Town Hall webinar series with uh, David Anderson. Uh, we have uh, uh, really enjoyed doing these uh, over the last uh, nearly 18 months and uh, uh, we got some fantastic feedback on how um, in these uh, webinars have helped uh, people and you know ask basic questions and answer uh, you know get uh, responses based on questions from other people as well and so uh, we uh, are looking forward to a great session today as well uh, today's session uh, will also include a, a full presentation by David on the depth of uh, Kanban implementation uh, and uh, I will leave David to uh, introduce the topic uh, fully. Uh, just a couple of uh, uh, housekeeping uh, rules and uh, rather housekeeping items and then we can get started. Uh, so we will take questions, Q, questions and, uh, and respond to them uh, both uh, via the Q&A box that you see uh, on the bottom right side of your screen and uh, also uh, if you want to ask the question uh, or using your mic uh, you can just use the uh, hand icon that you will see. Uh, somewhere in the middle of the right panel um, on, the, on, on the right side of your screen and uh, based on the sequence in which uh, uh, people ask questions we will pass the microphone to them and uh, they can go ahead and ask the question live and we will try and respond to as many of uh, those questions as possible. So do have your questions ready and we will uh, uh, you know try and get to as many of them as possible. Um, the agenda today is a quick introduction and a quick word uh, from the sponsor that's uh, Swift Kanban. Uh, and after that we'll right away uh, get on to the presentation by David. Um, after that we will uh, hopefully get a good amount of time for uh, Q&A and uh, finally a wrap up. So let me get started. Uh, uh, today's, today's main speaker is uh, David Anderson, uh, CEO of DJ Anderson Associates and again to most people I don't believe that David needs an introduction but to those who, who do. Uh, David is a thought leader and pioneer in the field of lean Kanban for software development and managing effective software teams. He's got over 25 years in the software industry starting with uh, computer games in the early 1980s. Uh, he's led software teams delivering great productivity and quality using uh, innovative agile methods. Uh, David has uh, written two books. Uh, uh, Actually, he's now written the third one as well, uh, but the one that's sort of uh, really been uh, uh, revolutionary in helping uh, I, I especially software and IT organizations uh, adopt Kanban uh, for uh, agile software project uh, management and development is Kanban successful evolutionary change for your technology business. Uh, and I know that David is writing a third one, uh, a fourth one, uh, which is on advanced Kanban, and I guess he will talk a little bit more about that. Um, David is of course the president and CEO of uh, DJ Anderson Associates. Uh, DJ Anderson Associates provides consulting, coaching and training services to organizations adopting uh, Kanban and lean methods of software development, DevOps and IT operations uh, besides other business functions. And last but not the least, uh, David is also an advisor to Digitay uh, Swift Kanban and consults with us for overall product strategy especially in the area of lean Kanban and we are truly honored to uh, have him here as uh, a speaker today in today's conference. Uh, I'm your host. My name is uh, Mahesh Singh. Uh, I'm co-founder and senior vice president of product at uh, Digitech. And I have uh, another panelist with me, Ram Subramaniam, who had sales. And many of you who have uh, used the Swift Kanban product would have uh, interacted with him. And uh, together we will uh, help answer any questions that you may have uh, at the end of today's presentation by David. Um, so just a quick uh, word about Swift Kanban and Digitay. We are a, a pioneer in uh, web-based collaborative products uh, and solutions for geographically distributed teams. Uh, we had called in Mountain View, California and we have nearly 300,000 users uh, around the world on uh, our various products. Uh, our products cover Lean Kanban, Agile ALM and project portfolio management. Uh, for uh, software teams, IT and even for non-IT organizations. And uh, Swift Kanban is our uh, flagship Lean Kanban product uh, which we have uh, built uh, in, in partnership or in, uh, under advice from David and of course uh, uh, a number of other uh, uh, advisors as well. 
Um, so we've been named in the Gartner ALM Market Scope Report and other ALM documents. So we've been around for some time and have a lot of experience uh, helping teams uh, do distributed software development, uh, IT management, project management, uh, using a variety of tools. And just a quick uh, smattering of uh, uh, the uh, the uh, uh, kind of customers that we have. Uh, now, before I uh, let the floor open to uh, to David, um, I'm going to just go ahead and uh, put up this slide here for uh, for uh, you know how we can go ahead and take Q and A after David's presentation. I'd like to go ahead and uh, uh, ask you all a question. I'm going to, we're going to do some poll questions today, and I'd like to see. Uh, We'd like to see what kind of uh, um, you know uh, spread we have in terms of your experiences uh, with Kanban. So can we bring up the first poll question for everybody to look at? Uh, so we wanted to basically just get a sense of uh, in in uh, in the audience today. You know how familiar are you with Kanban? Uh, if you're just starting up or uh, you've gone through some training, very familiar, or you're an expert or a consultant. So just just that just so it gives us some idea of. Uh, how we shape this uh, webinar as we keep going on it. Okay, we'll give it a few more seconds and then we close the poll. All right, so let's be let's just go ahead and close the poll and see what uh, we see here. Share the share the poll in just a second. It looks like we are having some trouble with sharing the poll results. Oh, there you go. All right. So, as you can all see, uh, of the people who have responded, uh, there is quite a spread uh, between people who have who are just starting. Uh, with uh, Kanban versus those who are very familiar with it and uh, are experts uh, on the on the on the subject. So, good uh, gives us a gives us a bit of an idea of uh, the the, uh, uh, in the kind of uh, audience we have today, and hopefully uh, it'll reflect in the kind of interaction that we have. So, with that, uh, let me go ahead and uh, make David the presenter here. And uh, uh, David, I'm going to. Start off by asking you the question that we uh, have been discussing in the last few uh, last few days about uh, you know are people doing Kanban or not and what is the depth of its implementation? I know that you have uh, you know uh, been talking about that in, uh, in the last several weeks since the uh, UDF retreat in uh, in Austria. So I guess you have uh, a lot of thoughts to share there. So David, over to you. Good morning. <coughs> Good morning. Uh, thanks, Mahesh. Uh, Good morning, afternoon, evening for those of you who are joining us from other parts of the world. Um, can you guys now see the, the, the slides I'm presenting, Mahesh? Yes, I can see it. We can see it. Okay, very good. So we're on the title page, the How Deep Is Your Kanban? Uh, good. So uh, we're often asked, um, are we doing Kanban or not? And over the last couple of years, I have encouraged people to realize that, that this it isn't a binary question of are we doing it or not, or are we doing it correctly. And uh, as you'll see, uh, just very recently, we've changed the way that we ask people to uh, think about this question. So. Uh, Kanban, are we doing it or not? And it, it's really not a question of are, are we doing it or not, or is our Kanban implementation right or wrong? It, it's really been a question of the depth of implementation. And those of you familiar with uh, my Kanban book uh, will know that in 2010, when this was published, uh, in chapter two, I included the idea of five core Kanban practices, and these were practices that had been observed on successful Kanban implementations. And very recently, I've added a sixth one to the list. It, it's not new, 
it was always there, but I sort of took it for granted, and uh, it was uh, implied, uh, in fact, it, um, it was covered in the book elsewhere, but it wasn't made explicit as one of the core practices. So the list is now six, and if we take a look at that list, um, these are numbered one through six, not necessarily in the order of adoption, it could just be six bullet points. Um, and over the years, I've modified the wording of these to, to simplify it and uh, make them as, as general as possible. So we have visualize, limit work in progress, manage flow, make policies explicit, implement feedback loops. This is the new one. This number five is, is the sixth one added to the list. Um, so that's an update to chapter two of the current book. And then the sixth one here used to be number five. And again, we've played with the wording of this. And this is uh, currently um, uh, the, the, the latest version of the wording that may change again before a second edition of the book is published. But it's capturing many of the ideas that we want captured to improve collaboratively, evolve experimentally, and experiments imply the use of models and the scientific method. There's an active discussion uh, today on the Kanban Dev Yahoo group about the wording of this uh, practice number six. If you would like to voice an opinion, uh, you're welcome to post on the, the Yahoo group. So people would say, are we doing Kanban or not? And we certainly didn't want people um, taking a view, hey, we're not doing all five or now six practices, uh, we're not doing Kanban. So that, uh, I argued since the, the, the middle of 2010 that we should consider the concept of shallow versus deep implementations and that organizations making a shallower implementation should expect um, perhaps less dramatic results that the, 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 that the quality of the results be better the deeper the implementation was. So I had suggested that a very shallow implementation would only involve visualization and a deep implementation would involve all six of these practices. Uh, and that's been fine uh, until uh, last month when, uh, as we'll see, uh, Hack and Forsch here, who is a Kanban consultant from Sweden, uh, he came to our Kanban leadership retreat, uh, which is a consultant's camp style event. Um, and this year we held that in Meyerhof in, in Austria. And Hacken came to the event and he asked the question, uh, from a shallow to deep perspective, are these practices in the right order? And there was perhaps 10 to 15 people in the room and we debated uh, the topic and you know, possible alternative orderings. And it became evident that there was no one uh, sequence that was uh, uh, an acceptable solution. So uh, we decided to use this approach of of using a, a caveat style diagram, um, sometimes referred to as a, as a spider chart. It's a way of representing a multi-dimensional space. And you'll see that we have uh, six axes on this uh, star-shaped diagram, and we've labeled the axes visualize, limit, width, manage flow, explicit policies, feedback loops, and improvement. And if we were to be able to somehow assess how well are you visualizing, then we would place that to the, the, the outer edge of the arrow. And if you weren't visualizing so much, then that would be towards the inner part of the, the diagram. So uh, shallow implementations would be plotted to the inside, and deep implementations would be plotted to the outside. 
and we could assess the shallowness or the, 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 the depth on each of the axes independently. And what's valuable about this style of diagram is there's no implied sequence that you could start simply with making policies explicit and not necessarily with visualization or limiting web. Although it's certainly true that the Kanban method is named for the fact that Kanban systems are involved and that does imply a limiting web. So, uh, we you know, we can use this chart to uh, plot the depth of separate practices, and you see here that I've plotted one where there's really good visualization, there's a strong Kanban system implementation, um, the managing flow, explicit policies, feedback loops, and improvements are not quite so much. So we plot the points and then we join up those points and it gives us a shape. And the larger the shape, uh, the, the, the greater the depth of implementation. Right. So uh, a chart like this raises the next question of how do we put a scale on the six axes? And we didn't have time to answer this question in Meyerhofen. So I've been putting some thought into it, and what I'm about to present is my first attempt at putting some at scale on those axes. And therefore, it's, it's very much a draft a work in progress, and I'm certainly interested in your feedback. So if I move on here, the first one is visualize, and I had to think about all the different ways that uh, that people visualize Kanban boards, they can simply be visualizing the work tickets for work items, um, tasks, features, uh, things that, that they're uh, concerned about completing. They might have some mechanism for visualizing different work item types. You know, so work of different types might be shown on different colored tickets or on different lanes on the board, or using different shapes of card, or different sizes of card. Uh, then we might visualize the workflow. We might visualize Kanban limits. Uh, we might have a way of signaling that something is ready for pull, that it's done. And many uh, physical Kanban boards and Swift Kanban product separate columns into two sub-columns, an in-progress and a done. Uh, we might visualize blocking issues and special cause variations. Uh, we might explicitly show capacity allocation uh, across different types or different classes of service, and therefore have uh, width limits for those and, and want to visualize the, how we're allocating the capacity. Um, we might visualize metrics related aspects such as the lead time or the local cycle time or the SLA target. We see examples where people put dots or tally marks beside the ticket while they count the, the, the local cycle time. We've seen cards where people record uh, cycle times through individual columns on the card itself. We've seen examples of cards with progress bars where the gradually color the progress bar as the total lead time uh, it accumulates. And sometimes those mechanisms have a way of indicating some sort of uh, target lead time. Um, very simple examples from my past implementations included things like a red triangle to indicate 50% of the target lead time had expired and a red star to indicate the total lead time had expired, and therefore the, the SLA target had been missed. So we might visualize those things. We might uh, visualize inter-work item dependency. Uh, that would include hierarchical parent-child dependencies, but also peer-to-peer -peer dependencies and things like system integration dependency. And we may also visualize inter-workflow dependency. That's the concept where uh, a ticket on a on a Kanban board and, and in a Kanban system, 
um, has to wait while it is sent to another Kanban system to be processed or sent for, you know, for some external uh, processing by another group, perhaps a vendor. And then we have other risk dimensions, um, the most well known and, and documented in the current book is the cost of delay dimension of risk, which is uh, typically visualized using different colors of card. But there are many other risk dimensions that could be analyzed and captured in a Kanban system. Uh, technical risk, for example, uh, the market risk of an item changing while it's being worked on. Uh, they, uh, I've been documenting a number of these in other presentations. So I thought, okay, well, here's a list of at least 10. Perhaps if we score one for each aspect, that gives us a, a score of somewhere between 1 and 15. Uh, so rather than try to use a a, a taxonomy that increments and implies a sequence or an ordering, we would just have a scoring. The, the second axis would be limit whip, and this one is uh, a little simpler. Um, at the very core of a Kanban system implementation it is the lean idea of um, making a decision at the last responsible moment. And Kanban systems uh, challenge you to defer commitment until you've pulled a, a work item into the input queue of the Kanban system. And then everything in the backlog should essentially be uncommitted and, and ideally unprioritized. So deferred commitment and then once a ticket's on the board, ideally we want deferred staff assignment. We don't want to be matching uh, work items with the staff who will work on them until, again, the last responsible moment, which is ideally the point where someone on the team or within the workflow is free to do new work and they walk up to the board and, and select an item and, and pull it so that they can work on it. So that's a very core concept in Kanban but it's actually implementable without whip limits. The next stage would be uh, what we're now calling proto Kanban. This includes personal Kanban, the concept of a whip limit per person, or the idea that you have a workflow, but you're putting infinite limits on the done queues. That uh, if you have a, a Kanban uh, system or board where you have limits on the in progress, uh, sub queues, but an infinite limit on the done queues, what you actually have is a series of decoupled personal Kanban systems, even if there are several people uh, working on each of those personal Kanbans. So all of those uh, slight variations there uh, we've been referring to as proto Kanban um, within the core community, and Richard Turner is in the process of documenting uh, some of this, hopefully for a book that uh, we'll be publishing on the Bluehole Press label. Uh, then we have single workflow pool system with whip limits. This is what we really associate with the beginning of Kanban as we know it today, dating from the fall of 2004. And that implies that we have a, a workflow where there's an end-to-end -end pool system with whip limits. There's no infinite queues decoupling them. And then finally, multiple independent workflows, each with a pool system. Uh, sorry, that should be interdependent, multiple interdependent workflows, pool system. And this would give us a simple taxonomy of four. And it, it does imply some sequencing simply because uh, each is a subset of the next. Our, our third dimension is managed flow. Here I've tried to capture a number of aspects of managing flow. Daily meetings, cumulative flow diagrams, uh, measuring the delivery rate sometimes known as velocity or throughput, and perhaps plotting that in a run, run or control chart. Um, 
having a lead time target or service level agreement, a flexible staff allocation of swarming behavior, deferred pool decisions. You'll notice that some of these are overlapping with other dimensions. And uh, metrics for assessing flow, such as number of days blocked, lead time efficiency. And if you're doing these things, then you could score uh, one for each of those aspects. And this would give us, a, I believe, a score between one and seven, or I guess zero is also possible. So zero to seven. Um, fourth dimension, make policies explicit. Uh, I'm open to input on this, but thinking about it, I came up with only two main categories, workflow Kanban system policies and staff allocation and work assignment policies. Uh, so within the Kanban system, the, there's the pool criteria, the definition of done or exit criteria, depending on whether you have an agile or traditional uh, mindset. Uh, the capacity allocation, queue replenishment policies, classes of service. Each individual class of service is a set of policies telling you how something should be treated. Um, and staff allocation or work assignment policies um, may include things like uh, if we have several staff free and we have some ticket to be worked on, um, do we have some policy around who who would be selected to work on that ticket? Perhaps we prefer to have suitably qualified junior people work on a ticket in preference to a more experienced senior person, and we hold the senior person in reserve so that they can be uh, utilized for swarming behavior if it becomes necessary. Um, very similar thing exists within Toyota, for example, where the uh, immediate supervisor on an assembly line is skilled to work on usually six activities and is capable of uh, jumping in to assist the worker on any one of those activities uh, if and when they need help. Um, if those of you listening have input on other types of policy that are commonly made explicit within the Kanban implementation, I'd like to hear about that. Um, but I think a good place is to post it on Kanban Dev, but you're also welcome to email me. You see my email address in the bottom right hand corner at dja at djaa.com. And again, we would just score this um, with one point for each aspect. Okay, so related uh, second session that again Hack and Force ran at our meeting in Austria. Uh, he had been reading Toyota Kata and asking himself the question, what are the Kanban Kata? And he proposed three Kanban Kata, which really uh, resonated with me. The stand-up meeting in front of the board, uh, of course, documented in the current book. Then uh, the, the coaching Kata, the concept of a mentor-mentee relationship, usually between a superior, a superior and a, a subordinate, such as a line manager and an individual contributor on a team, or a second line manager, a, a, a director, often in, a, in an American company, with the line manager. So that managerial coaching that would go on, and, and specifically in a process-related fashion, that actually existed in our 2007 uh, Kanban implementation in my organization at Corbis in Seattle. It's something that um, I just took for granted as what managers do, and it didn't really occur to me to capture it as part of the Kanban method. So uh, I do feel it's a very important aspect of, of a successful implementation. And Hacken's presentation persuaded me that that should be included in a in a future revision of the method and second edition of the book. So we've captured this as one of the Kanban kata, and the third one he proposed was the operations review. So uh, the the Kanban kata gives us a very strong way of introducing Kanban in an organisation from a, a coaching perspective and really uh, communicating uh, 
with the management, what they're expected to do as managers, and with the organisation as a whole, uh, it, it's a way of helping to shift the culture in the direction we need it to go. So I think Kanban Kata gives us a very powerful uh, coaching tool, and I've already introduced it as a strong aspect of my three-day advanced classes uh, designed for Kanban coaches, uh, consultants, and managers who are leading or deeply involved in the Kanban uh, initiative. So the Kanban Kata gives us a clue about how we can assess the feedback loop dimension because we simply ask the question how many of the Kanban Kata are present. Our regular team meetings typically daily in front of the board or the Kanban system software, are they happening? Is there a mentor-mentee relationship in place and is that um, you know, uh, uh, common across the organization? And are operations reviews happening at the business unit or organization level involving qualitative and quantitative review of data, um, typically from multiple Kanban systems? Um, and this is providing us the inter-workflow feedback mechanism. So we have a simple taxonomy of three. I'm making an assumption that operations review doesn't exist without the mentor-mentee relationship being present. Um, I'd certainly be interested in hearing from anyone who has observed an organization where there was no such mentoring, there was no uh, Kanban coaching kata present, but there was an operations review present. If you've seen that circumstance, I'd like to hear from you. But for now, I'm assuming that, uh, that these three appear in sequence. Uh, and then finally, we have improve, collaborate, and evolve experimentally. And uh, I, I think about what's involved here. Evidence of local process. In other words, have we seen things like changes to the workflow, changes to the policies, changes to WIP limits? Is there evidence of an increasing depth of Kanban implementation on the other five axes of the diagram? And evidence that the process evolution was model driven, the use of metrics, identification of model elements like bottlenecks, common and special cost variation, transaction and coordination costs, or, or the use of other models not currently specified in the Kanban book. Um, particularly, we see things like the use of real option theory. Uh, evidence of process or management policy evolution as a result of a mentor-mentee relationship and evidence of inter-workflow process or management policy evolution as a result of operations review. So if we go looking for those things, would we find it? And if so, we would be able to measure the depth. And again, this gives us a taxonomy of five. And I'm currently assuming that there is a sequence here that you really can't do uh, the third one, evidence of process evolution using models, if you're not doing the previous two, or we haven't seen evidence of, of the previous two, and that you really couldn't do uh, the fifth one without the third and fourth one in place. Again, if you are sitting in the middle of an organization where you see evidence of, say, uh, number four, but not evidence of numbers one and two, or three for that matter. I'd like to hear about those circumstances, but uh, the way I've modeled this so far is based on my own experience. So uh, if we put all that together back onto our chart, uh, we've now got some scale on each of the axes. So we have our six axes visualized with a from one to 10 plus limit whip with last responsible moment, proto Kanban, full Kanban system, and multiple Kanban systems, uh, managed flow with a score of one through seven, explicit policies with a score of one to five plus, 
feedback loops, the three Kanban kata, um, really the team, uh, the, the, the team uh, meeting, the coaching relationship and the operations review. And then with the improvements, we have the, the observed evolution of the Kanban system, the deepening of the implementation elsewhere, uh, model-driven improvements, um, coached improvements, uh, improvements coming as a direct result of the mentor-mentee relationship, and then operations review as the highest uh, level there, the, the deepest level. And now we have a framework for making an assessment of the depth of a Kanban implementation. So if we were to look at the Corbis from 2007, these pictures are from January 2007, very early in the implementation. Um, if we were to map the implementation by, say, October 2007, it would score uh, uh, this way. There would be 10 plus on visualization. We had multiple interdependent Kanban systems, multiple depend independent ones, but we had some interdependency. Um, we were doing perhaps five of the aspects of managing flow and three or four of the explicit policy. We did have an operations review in place and the operations review was directly driving, um, often manager-led, uh, larger scale improvements, as well as we were seeing all the things underneath the, the, the much smaller improvements that come from the after meetings, uh, at, from the daily stand-ups and, and uh, the individual contributor-led Kaizen events. So Corpus, IT department by the fall of 2007, very deep implementation, almost a, a, a fully filled out hexagon. What if we consider the very first Kanban implementation from Microsoft in 2005? This is the team here, with the exception of the Caucasian guy with the sunglasses. Uh, the rest of them were based in Hyderabad in India. And if we look at uh, the, the implementation there, we see a very different shape. Because these guys had no Kanban board. The, the visualization was really limited to a cumulative flow diagram accessed only by one of the managers. They did have a full Kanban system in place. So they were limiting WIP and they had a you know, fully functional pool system mapped over their PSP, TSP method. Um, in terms of managing flow, perhaps only two out of the seven aspects in place and uh, explicit policies, again, two, maybe three of the aspects. There was no uh, daily meeting. There was no mentor-mentee relationship within the <coughs> within the uh, organization in terms of feedback and creating further improvements. And there was no operations review. However, on the improvement uh, dimension here, I have marked it as coached because the improvements that were implemented came as a direct result of my coaching the manager, Dragos Dimitriou, and us making very qualitative and quantitative assessment of considerable amounts of data, often as much as 15 months worth of prior data um, in order to identify uh, issues. Um, uh, in one particular case, data was telling us something and Dragos actually flew to Hyderabad and sat and watched the team working in order to determine that our hunch was correct before we implemented a change. So the, the changes were definitely model-driven. They were coached, and uh, th there was a, a lot of quantitative uh, assessment made in advance. So you see we have a very different shape here. And this was really the first ever Kanban implementation. It's, it's the one that made me think this is a good idea. It predates the Kanban movement. 
Uh, so this represents a, a relatively uh, shallow implementation, but we've certainly seen shallower ones since then. Right? The, there's a reason why I have LRM and Proto Kanban on the limit width dimension. So the question for each of you listening to this is, can you draw this chart for your team or organization? Uh, and if so, what would it look like? And I've given you a nice blank one here that uh, that you might want to copy from. It might be a good idea if we made this template available from our website or the Limited Whip Society website. So if Janice is listening, um, that's another thing for your backlog. Sorry. So in summary, um, this work is new and it's provisional in nature. Um, it's open to feedback. It will probably appear in class material. It will appear in presentations at conferences, perhaps. It may be some time before this is captured in a book, so we have plenty of time to revise it. Um, I know that Kanban coaches in Sweden, Germany, and Austria, uh, as, as well as myself, we've already adopted this, and I've been teaching it to Kanban coaches in the United Kingdom very recently. Um, innovation like this it emerges when we bring the best Kanban people together, and that's why we do our leadership retreats. We find that um, while we all enjoy the bigger conferences where we get to share Kanban success and ideas with a wider audience, we don't get the opportunity to really create uh, uh, leading edge um, material and to move forward the state of the art of Kanban. Uh, so this is really evidence that the leadership retreat events uh, work in a very positive way. We believe if this technique for assessing the, the depth of implementation has wide and useful application, and it's re it helps to reinforce the good work that people have done, and it provides um, uh, some sort of qualitative comparison in terms of the shape, but it, it avoids direct quantitative comparison. Um, you know, it, it it avoids the opportunity for us to give a Kanban implementation a score or a level or describe it as some sort of maturity level. And it certainly moves us away from a binary situation of uh, are you doing it or not. The shape of the diagram does give indications of, of areas for uh, coaching, training, and focus, uh, you know, implementation focus. And I believe if you were plotting these charts across different parts of your organization, it would help you reflect on uh, where uh, individual teams or workflows were strong and where they weren't so strong, and it might encourage more senior managers to uh, cross-pollinate uh, capabilities by moving staff around. Or if you find one organization that's very good at the mentor-mentee relationship or the operations review, you might want to move some people elsewhere in your organization so that they take that knowledge and skill set with them. And we'd like to encourage people to draw these charts regularly, perhaps quarterly or, or twice yearly, and use it as a way of reflecting on how they're improving. And then finally, I would love it if you could draw charts like this and share them, share pictures of them on the Limited Whip Society, because it would really help us understand uh, depth of Kanban implementation more globally. Uh, I only get to see you know, so many people and so many organizations when they come to my classes and workshops and conferences. And it's very difficult from those interactions to, to truly assess um, how much depth we have in implementations. We currently believe that only about 3% of Kanban implementations do operations reviews. And yet we know it's very important and vital in driving a, a true Kaizen culture and delivering significant benefits from the use of Kanban. 
So having some of these charts captured and, and being able to share them community-wide, I think, would help us all understand better just how deep the, the Kanban implementations are around the world. You might be thinking, wow, that sounded like a really cool conference they had in Austria. How do I get invited to be at the next one? The, the next one will be in San Diego. And this is a picture of the venue. It's on the waterfront near San Diego Airport. Very easy to uh, get to. And it will be held uh, November 28th to 30th. We should be announcing this officially next week. But with all Kanban leadership retreats, it will be invitation only. And only if we haven't sold out the maximum number of places, which is 50. If we're not sold out, we will open up the remainder to a wider audience later. To get on the invite list, you have to be one of my clients or have attended one of our three-day advanced Kanban master classes or the Kanban um, coaching and leadership workshop, uh, as they used to be called. Upcoming uh, versions are at Sao Paulo, 23rd to 25th of this month, in Chicago, 5 to 7 September, and Berlin, 12 to 14 September. And if you attend one of these events, you will be automatically invited to San Diego. Um, uh, and if you want more details, contact Janice, uh, Janice Linden Reed, Janice at djaa.com. And the URL is there if you wish to go ahead and register for one of these classes now. I also have a new book out, as Mahesh mentioned. I believe it should be available via uh, sites such as Amazon within the next week, um, one to two weeks. Uh, this is a 115,000 words, over 400 pages. And it will give you many insights into how Kanban came about, my approach to leadership, management, and implementing change. And it really bridges the gap between my earlier Agile management work and the Kanban work. And you'll see it includes uh, four words by Alan Charlie and Steve Denning. Um, so uh, available very soon from your favorite online retailer in uh, hard copy. The electronic uh, book version is perhaps two to three months uh, away. And with that, um, thank you. More, uh, a nice big version of my email and uh, website URL. And I'll hand it back to Mahesh so that we can uh, take questions for the next, uh, I believe we have about 45 minutes. Thank you, David. Uh, that was a fascinating uh, presentation. And I think uh, more so because uh, I think uh, in our uh, probably just over a year's experience of helping our customers with uh, implementing a Kanban tool. Um, I think we've seen exactly this kind of uh, behavior where uh, uh, depending on the kind of uh, uh, focus that the organization has, the kind of uh, <coughs> challenges they may have faced uh, before they started to implement Kanban, uh, you know, they they just they're, they they get some significant benefits by just doing a few things, like perhaps uh, uh, you know just visualizing, just putting up a Kanban board, and because that gives them so much of initial uh, you know improvement or benefit uh, or perceived improvement, let's say, that uh, then you know going beyond that uh, becomes a significant uh, inertia for them. Uh, so I was wondering, uh, let me, there are a few questions that have already come in, uh, but uh, let me start off with a question of my own that do you think that in addition to plotting the, uh, the uh, and I'm going to go back to you, the, the, the template that you showed earlier, in, in addition to plotting the, uh, the sort of, uh, uh, you know, actual practices on this, on this chart which uh, tells us what uh, the teams are doing, uh, do you think there it might make sense to have some, some sort of a correlation uh, with another chart which shows how much of improvement or how much of benefit they are getting because of what they have done so far? Um, and so therefore look at this chart in conjunction with, I don't know, uh, maybe a lead time improvement chart or, or uh, uh, you know, a CFD progress uh, shows the throughput of the velocity, something like that. 
Uh, absolutely. Uh, clearly, we want people to pursue Kanban implementations to show genuine improvement. It, it's the outcomes that we're interested in. And th there is perhaps a danger with a system like this uh, that it gets a little bit like the CMMI where people look at all the uh, uh, process areas and the goals within the process areas and the recommended practices and they think, hey, as long as we can tick the box on all the practices, everything's good. I, I think it's important that people are leading with um, the, the metrics and the demonstrating uh, that they are better balancing uh, the, their capability against the demand they're getting from the customer. So the, the sort of metrics that are reported at operations review, demand versus capability broken out by um, work item type and by class of service where types are determined by the source of the demand or the, the, the destination for the demand, the deployment environment. Uh, those type of things are, are incredibly important. And you'll notice that in this framework, uh, part of it is that you are uh, capable of reporting metrics such as uh, lead time, uh, lead time efficiency, uh, throughput, the cumulative flow diagram, um, and perhaps visualizing the, uh, the the derivative of the the final line on the cumulative flow diagram, the completion rate. So those things are very important. Uh, I think a number of um, implementations are already doing it, but but it is clearly part of the depth of the implementation. There will be shallower implementations where people are not collecting those metrics and are not actually able to quantitatively show improvement over a period of time. Right, right, absolutely. Uh, and again, we also have seen this uh, and heard from a few of our customers that uh, they are not yet completely sure that they are getting the sort of uh, full benefit of Kanban uh, and uh, obviously they are hopefully talking to not only us but also um, someone like you David or uh, you know other other coaches that they might have. Um, so let me now uh, open up the questions to other people as well. So once again to uh, all of the participants, uh, uh, you can either raise your hand and ask questions or you can enter your questions in the Q&A box. And uh, let me start with the first question that has come in from uh, Kirk Bright. Kirk, uh, good to see you again uh, on uh, one of our webinars. Uh, uh, and Kirk's question, I think David, you can see it also on the right hand side, is uh, my, new, my new Scrum team is having difficulty establishing a consistent predictable velocity. The reason is that in addition to the new dev work, they must support previous project software, which is, uh, which is high priority than the new work. Any suggestions? And uh, Kirk, I'm going to also, uh, you know, uh, open up the mic to you. So if, the, if there's any clarifications, you can certainly ask. Uh, Mahesh, I can't see that in the right-hand side panel. I'm wondering if Kirk sent it to you privately. Um, oh, if you um, can perhaps pa paste it into Skype for me and okay, or find um, some other way of showing it to me. Can you look, can you see the Q&A? Uh, panel on the right side, it might be minimized for you. You might see one of the blue lines uh, says Q&A on the right side of your screen. Ah, okay, yeah, it's the chat that I'm looking at. So right, so yeah, it's below the chat. Okay, yeah, Kirk, right, okay. So my new Scrum team is having difficulty. Okay. Okay, so the, you know this is clearly um, uh, it, actually it's a very common issue, and it's um, uh, it, it's a number of ways we can describe this, but it's a, a variability problem that the uh, support work for the previous project is unplanned demand and it's also unpredictable demand. 
and it, it's higher priority, that means it's a higher class of service. And I suspect that that higher class of service is implicit rather than explicit, that that policy has not been made fully explicit. And people are not thinking through all the implications. Um, so the suggestions here, the, uh, I, Mahesh, I'm hearing a lot of noise all of a sudden. Yes, uh, I can also, I think it's coming from Kirk's end, but uh, yes, go ahead. Okay. Uh, you've made that. Um, So, uh, you know, what would we do here? Well, first of all, I think you would want to visualize the, the two types of work. You would want to be uh, gathering data. And uh, we've seen an example of this. There's a slide that I use often that I borrowed from Matthias Skarin and one of his clients, where they were plotting the uh, weekly velocity from a team and then they were overlaying a line uh, plotting the quantity of support tasks and they showed the inverse uh, correlation that on weeks when they had a large number of support tasks they had a much lower velocity and this uh, visualization and metric was enough to start driving uh, some process changes which enabled them to uh, reduce the impact of those support tasks uh, it's not clear to me exactly what was done, whether they implemented a root cause fix that reduced the quantity of support or whether they found a way of encapsulating the, the support in a way that was less disruptive. But the net effect was that their velocity did improve, both the, the mean velocity improved and the spread of variation narrowed considerably. But it is worth mentioning that uh, velocity is a metric with an inherent variability in it because of the nature of the work we do. And uh, I typically see spreads of variation that vary from about 1.4 times the mean to two, 2 times or more. So if you have a mean of 50, it's not unusual to see uh, you know, an upper number of between 75 and 100 and a lower number of between 25 and 35. Um, and, and I think that many scrum teams waste too much energy trying to stabilize that velocity metric uh, and actually uh, it's, the, it's the wrong thing to do. What they need to do is change the way that they negotiate scope and commitment with their customers. I hope that was helpful. Unfortunately, uh, Kurt doesn't have a microphone, so we're, we're not able to uh, uh, interact with him, but uh, I certainly hope that it was. Uh, so if we, let's go on to the next question that's uh, come from Ben Hogan. Um, and I guess David, you should be able to see it also. Uh, so can you briefly describe the difference between your recipe for success, starting with quality and the six practices? Okay, well, it's an interesting question. Um, I know Ben was, was at an event in Austria, and at some point um, during Kraken's session on um, the Kanban Kata, I may have talked a little bit about the, the recipe for success. Really, the, the concept behind that for me as a manager was coming in and saying, what are the you know, practical things that I can implement that will cause improvement. And for those of you listening and not familiar with chapter three of the book, uh, the, the six items are focus on quality, reduce work in progress, deliver often, balance the demand against the throughput, prioritize and attack sources of variability to improve predictability. My argument was that uh, doing Kanban actually enabled me to um, achieve all of these things. And it strikes me, there's another question 
Um, I'm trying to see who it came from, from uh, Jorge Ronchese, uh, um, if I remember correctly, in Buenos Aires. And uh, he said something like, have you spent some thought about combining this with actually getting goals that we're trying to achieve? And really, if you um, if you look at the recipe for success, they're really quite goal-oriented. Um, some of them more external than others focus on quality, uh, deliver often, balance the demand against throughput. Um, certainly things customers would care about. Um, reducing work in progress. Uh, and I use this word prioritize because the recipe for success dates from about 2004. Um, I probably wouldn't use that the, the same word anymore. And attack the sources of variability to improve predictability. Uh, the, these three are um, in many ways quite process focused. But they're all things that typically for a line manager would provide some form of uh, relief or uh, increased, increased uh, trust or political capital or um, uh, just simply make the customers happier. Uh, so the, the advantage is that Kanban systems, by limiting WIP, they actually help us focus on quality better. We can make the quality policies very explicit in terms of uh, exit criteria or definitions of done. Um, uh, a Kanban system, of course, limits the work in progress, and that's uh, nearly always a reduction in terms of batch size. Uh, delivering often is a matter of the cadence that we set for delivery. Balancing demand against throughput is um, all part of the Kanban system design. And while it's very easy to say, um, that, that topic will become really an entire section of, of a future version of the book. Uh, prioritization really means things like uh, determining capacity allocations, classes of service policies, uh, queue replenishment policies, and, um, uh, and pool criteria, and, uh, and staff allocation or uh, assignment policies. Uh, so there is a, a strong relationship between these things. Uh, and also related to Horgy's question, it strikes me that both of these would be very good topics for a future leadership retreat. I think it would be good to sit down with Ben and Horgy in, uh, in San Diego uh, at the end of November and figure this stuff out. I think both very valuable questions. Great. Uh, so before we go on to the next question, David, I would like to uh, go ahead and uh, 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 raise another poll uh, to get a profile of uh, you know how our how our attendees are implementing Kanban. So let's have the second uh, poll question up there. So here, basically, we just like to uh, get a sense of what is the level of Kanban implementation, and then um, uh, Again, what are the aspects of Kanban that you have implemented? And that would be the next uh, uh, next poll question. So we'll take a minute here to uh, get people's responses in. All right, let's take a look at the results. All right, we've got a few answers, uh, and clearly a lot of people have uh, implemented several pilots already, and uh, uh, yeah, some a uh, number of people are just starting off or are somewhere in the early part of the Kanban journey. Um, we uh, let's let's go ahead and go ahead and ask the next poll question as well, and that will relate somewhat to the uh, presentation that David did today about uh, uh, the uh, depth of Kanban implementation. So let's go ahead and do the next poll as well.
All right. Well, looks like we may be having some trouble there. So while we are waiting for the next poll question to come, David, let me just go ahead and take up the next question. Um, and I guess this is a question that uh, is perhaps typical for uh, people who are uh, currently using Scrum and are looking at the value of Kanban. Um, all right. So let me, since we have got the poll up there, let me just go ahead and uh, let uh, people uh, respond to that. So what are the key reasons for you to look at or use the Kanban, use Kanban as a, as a, a process improvement framework in your organization? So are we looking at a, just a simple visual management paradigm or to improve lead, lead or cycle time uh, for the promise of continuous delivery? To improve the overall work quality, and finally for better customer satisfaction, higher customer satisfaction. All right, let's close that out and see what we get. So based on the responses, David, again, we see that there is a uh, sort of slightly higher percentage of people looking for a visual management paradigm. And then, of course, uh, a lot of uh, people looking at customer satisfaction as one of the main benefits of uh, implementing Kanban. Uh, so let, let's go back to the Q&A. And uh, I was uh, going to uh, ask the question that has come in from Manik Chaudhary. Um, and I guess that's a question that uh, perhaps a lot of people who are currently using Scrum would uh, uh, would have that. Uh, and Malik's question is: I use Scrum. All, all the backlogs, tasks, etc., are maintained on the Scrum board. Uh, I limit the work in progress. And he says, please advise me as to why he should use Kanban um, and where can they use Kanban. Um. Yeah, well, at first, it's not clear from I limit wit whether that would represent a proto Kanban implementation or a you know, full pool system. Uh, it, it's impossible to tell from the way the sentence is written. Um, I, I'm really not here to sell Kanban to people if they think that um, things are going well for them. Uh, there really has to be some source of dissatisfaction and some motivation for change and improvement. And uh, I've done a number of presentations on this in the past. Uh, Kanban systems, which is primarily the limit whip uh, managed flow parts of, of our template, uh, a Kanban system will help you uh, deal with variability problems both common and special cause variability in in your system. And the, the, the Japanese, when they're talking about waste in the, the Toyota production system, they thought they used three Japanese words, muda, mura, and muri. M muda is the one that the, that the West focuses on, which is um, non-value adding activities. Uh, I mostly captured that as transaction and coordination costs. Uh, and I know that others have commented that delay would be a, a common one. But uh, Mura is variability in flow, and Muri is overburdening. And Kanban systems primarily help you deal with the Mura and the Muri, the, the variability in the flow and the overburdening. And it, if you don't have variability in your flow and you don't have overburdening or you already have it taken care of, there might not be motivation to, to introduce uh, Kanban systems. Uh, Kanban is also helping with things like 
uh, deferring commitment, but why would you defer commitment? Primarily because you have variability in flow and you cannot guarantee um, uh, predictable delivery. So uh, you really have to have some motivation for further improvement. And I, I need to understand how you're really limiting WIP and whether it really does represent uh, a, a Kanban style WIP limit. Um, the idea of filling up a, a, a time box with a bucket of velocity it is not limiting width. It, it's determining some kind of batch size perhaps, but it, it's not limiting width in the way that we imply with Kanban. Right, right. Um, and yeah, I agree that it is a, it is a much bigger question perhaps uh, to be taken offline. Um, and also, of course, there is a lot of um, reading material available both on uh, the David Anderson uh, Associate site website and as well as the Swift Kanban site, and perhaps some of that can uh, be answered through the information available there. I'd be certainly happy to uh, uh, take additional questions from you, Manik, uh, uh, to uh, to you know sort of fully answer that question and also to understand your situation a little better. Um, I guess the next question is uh, from Bess. Uh, best on and um, uh, and so is there a recommended way to measure velocity in comparison from uh, in comparison between scrum versus the kanban approach um i'm not seeing that question oh but um, maybe it doesn't matter it's a simple enough uh, question um I would need to understand how you're currently measuring it, but uh, velocity for me is a pseudonym for completion rate, and uh, I would encourage you to measure the completion rate of the work items, and if they're called user stories, then it's user stories over a period of time, and if that's not how you're currently measuring velocity, then um, clearly they would be different. But to me, velocity is complete. It's synonymous with completion rate, and it's completion of work items. And completion rate implies a number of work items over a period of time. Hopefully, that answers the question. Uh, the next question is from Andrew Fuqua. Um, and Andrew's uh, question is at the bottom of the Q and A uh, list, David. So. If you scroll all the way down, you might be able to see that. And um, uh, I'm, not, I'm also not seeing that one. Um, are you, look, you are looking at the Q&A uh, box, right? Yeah, I do see a reply from Kirk McKay. Oh, I just see it now. Yeah, yeah. it just popped up for me. Yeah. Okay, so Andrew's question is, in this presentation, daily meetings was listed under manage flow as well as implement feedback loops. Is there a subtle distinction there, some difference, or is it the same thing? Um, that's a good question. I, I hadn't thought about it in that much depth, Andrew. Uh, if you're familiar with the book, you'll know that I talk about the after meeting uh, which is uh, the, the concept of Kaizen events happening after a stand-up meeting. I'm not convinced that, that that's synonymous with the feedback loop. I think just the fact that people stand in front of the board uh, regularly and get to observe uh, the flow of work and what's flowing, what's not, what's working well, what, is it, what isn't, that, that is providing them with feedback. So. I'm really thinking that the, the, the regular meeting in front of the board, typically daily, is, um, is what I'm getting at and therefore, yes, they are the same, that um, they're appearing, that that activity is appearing on two dimensions. All right. Uh, just a reminder to everybody else who's on the call uh, that uh, we do have another 15 minutes uh, uh, for the call and uh, any additional questions uh, are most welcome. Uh, so David, uh, right below Andrew's question, there's a question from Joseph Furtado. Jo Joseph, welcome on the call. Uh, and uh, Joseph's question, uh, David, can you see that? Yes. All right. 
he has questions about dashboards so one of my favorite topics um I know that tool vendors like uh, Swift Kanban do put uh, energy into dashboards. Um, I, I think my approach here would always be contextual. If I was working with a client, I'd want to know uh, in what context and we'd build a dashboard from that. Uh, it's very difficult to answer this generally. For example, you could have two Kanban systems where one column or you know, one state in one of the systems, one column on their board represents the entire other board or a row on the other board. Um, you know, a scenario, for example, that you have a testing column on your board and your testing department is based in Chennai in India and they service testing for four other teams from your company. So your testing demand represents one row on their board and that one row represents one column on your board. A very simple integrated metric is lead time because the lead time that you're reporting will include the lead time that they incurred processing your testing demand. Uh, so that's just one very simple example. Uh, but there are just so many possibilities that it's difficult to to answer generically and certainly in a format like this. Absolutely. And I think, uh, uh, like you said earlier, uh, we have uh, in Swift Kanban, we provide a um, sort of aggregated uh, dashboard view across uh, different projects. And so far, we have seen very simple usage of that, or probably actually no usage of that, as uh, as uh, the majority of the teams focus primarily on uh, the uh, more standardized or simple uh, Kanban metrics, such as lead time uh, and cycle time, uh, as well as, uh, of course, using the CFD. And I think as uh, as the, uh, the uh, usage builds up uh, across boards and, and work starts to get assigned across boards, um, uh, uh, there will be you know, additional need for that. I think uh, in today's presentation, David, I thought also there are some good ideas for uh, looking at metrics uh, that measure how well Kanban is implemented and perhaps that might be another area to look at. Yeah, the, it's worth mentioning here with the, the dashboard idea that we really try to discourage the design of the great big Kanban system to solve them all uh, and the one Kanban board to solve all the organization's problems. That we encourage uh, a service oriented approach to a Kanban uh, rollout and implementation. Therefore, many smaller Kanban boards and Kanban systems um, one for each service and each one of those would be reporting independently at operations review um, detailing the demand even if they're receiving that from other internal Kanban systems so it's interdependent system demand they would report that as their demand and then they would report their capability to supply against that demand um, so that the dashboard concept is um, less important to me than the operations review concept. I know there will be situations where people want to roll up portfolio views and so on, but to be honest, I see that as a software development and project management method issue. And therefore the question would be, what are you already doing? because it's very important to remember Kanban is not a project management method nor is it a software development method. It is something that you do to your existing method to help it evolve and to control variability in flow and eliminate overburdening and help you manage risk better. It, it is not a project management or software development method in and of itself. Absolutely, I, I think that's such a great point. Um, I, I guess vendors have uh, less of a success uh, uh, trying to make that point. 
to a potential customer uh, I think uh, coming from you David that's uh, certainly very valuable and I, I think you're absolutely right uh, Kanban is really not um, you know uh, an extension of uh, an earlier portfolio management or a project management type of tool it is really to help in that improving that process rather than uh, provide an independent dashboard but at the same time there is there is uh, you know there is I think there is demand for the market and uh, sometimes for some very good reasons uh, to uh, to provide some of this uh, uh, sort of visualization in the Kanban tool itself and therefore um, there is sometimes sort of need to do that. Um, I know that Ram had a question. Uh, Ram, are you on the line? I think uh, we need to get him off mute. Hello, are you able to hear me? We can hear you now. Okay, great. Excellent. <laughs> so David, thanks for the, the wonderful presentation. So I have a question which is an evergreen question and always the discussion gives more and more information that uh, all of us can benefit. So we introduce, we have introduced this new product called Scrumbon and we are helping people who use Scrum to actually adopt uh, some principles of Kanban. Uh, and we've seen some customers move from this time box iteration based approach to uh, uh, flow based approach and many customers have asked me this question hey how do I do the transition from uh, iteration to a flow based approach and what benefits can I actually expect out of this transition you have some very good ideas about this when we talked last uh, David and I thought uh, if you can talk about it it will benefit a lot of us so I think there are a number of benefits to you have to ask yourself what what are the uh, reasons you want to make that switch well typically uh, we see people struggling with time boxes because they're uh, perhaps under pressure from the business to make the time box smaller in order to interact with the business more frequently and more frequent interaction or the demand for more frequent interaction is usually an indication that there's a lot of uncertainty in their business or in their market or the market is very dynamic and the business needs to be fast moving and if you try to interact very frequently and you're using a time box batch concept this creates a pressure to make the work items very small and to figure out how to do analysis to break things down into small quantities so that they can be fitted into the time box and uh, this uh, is often the source of considerable um, dissatisfaction, frustration and dysfunction these uh, two different pressures and implementing a flow system with Kanban will enable you to decouple those things um, albeit that you will need to introduce some configuration management capability so that you can have work in progress uh, while you are releasing other work that is completed so with a slightly more advanced configuration management and version control capability you have an ability to uh, implement a flow process and the cadence of interaction with the, the customers both in terms of cure replenishment and delivery those things can be decoupled from the length of time it takes to uh, make the work and you change the style of the commitment you're making you don't commit against a, a batch of work all to be delivered at the same time you move to perhaps more of a, a service level agreement style commitment or uh, you know, at some other uh, commitment that's oriented around metrics or measures or mechanisms of delivery that accommodate the variability that you're seeing so uh, this makes the system a, a lot more flexible and a number of things I talked about earlier today deferred commitment becomes part of it deferred uh, staff assignment becomes part of it 
the system becomes very transparent to the customers and this helps them build a lot of trust in its, uh, its operation. Um, the, the rules of the system in terms of how uh, capacity is allocated and how that allocation is matched against certain types of demand, that helps to build trust. So, uh, the, the, uh, so that was uh, part of the answer then. The other half is things like how do you make it happen? Uh, well, there's a very good uh, case study that Janice has presented many times uh, from a company in San Francisco called Posit Science where she worked. Um, between uh, 2007 and 2009. And uh, they have a classic example where they have a board with a workflow on it, three or four, perhaps five columns. They have rows on that board, one for each of their scrum teams. And there's a column that's marked test, and the testing column has a width limit at the top. And this is because they're testing uh, people essentially provided a service to all three of the scrum teams. And you can tell from this service oriented uh, test group that the testers are not embedded within the scrum teams even though they sat amongst them uh, in terms of your, their uh, physical space, their desk or cubicle allocation. And it, it, so if you have an arrangement like that where you have three development teams perhaps doing Scrum and you have a testing team that services all three, you put a width limit on the column for the testing team and you give them a very simple policy at the beginning of the implementation and you say, over the next four weeks, prioritize work from team one over team two over team three. And what will happen is that the, uh, the, the cadence of the operation, which had previously been running in a synchronous fashion, where in the positive science example, they ran three week sprints, and all three teams started on the same day and they all finished on the same day. Well, three weeks after implementing the flow system, with the test team acting as a service and prioritizing one team over another for that initial period of time, what that does is it decouples the, the, the cadence of the operation and it makes it uh, asynchronous so that we see uh, team one start and finish three weeks later and uh, uh, team two will not finish until the fourth week perhaps and team three until the fifth week and by the sixth week, all three teams are running in a decoupled fashion where there's one, approximately one team starting new work every week and there's one team delivering new work every week. Uh, so often it's as simple as that. It's as simple as implementing a whip limit uh, for a shared uh, team or a shared resource and giving them some sort of policy uh, to help them prioritize in the initial few days or weeks. Excellent. So I guess, uh, David, with that, uh, we have really uh, wound up another great session uh, with you. And uh, hopefully everybody uh, really had a good, very good time listening to uh, the discussion and, and your presentation on the uh, depth of Kanban implementation. So any other closing thoughts from your side? Um, thanks again for the opportunity. I thought it was um, um, very good that we got a chance to present some new material, really um, hot from the, the forms created at our leadership event uh, in, in Austria in June. And uh, please do follow up with Janice if you're interested in attending the leadership event in November in San Diego or the three-day classes in order to receive the invite. Um, thanks to Digite, um, I, I got a chance to see the latest version of Swift Kanban yesterday. It uh, really continues to improve, so uh, very, very worthwhile assessing and I hope that you'll uh, take a look at it. And, uh, 
Thanks again for listening, everyone. I appreciate uh, your time today. Thank you very much, David, for the kind words. And uh, again, as usual, I thoroughly enjoyed uh, the session today. And uh, we look forward to the next one um, sometime really soon. Uh, to all the attendees, thank you so much for uh, taking the time today to be on this uh, presentation. Uh, my apologies for one thing that I think in our email that we sent to you, we said 60 minutes, uh, but we had planned for this to be a 90-minute session to uh, uh, give enough time for all of, all of the Q&A that usually happens. Uh, and we make sure that we correct that uh, from the next uh, for the next uh, uh, webinar. Uh, just so uh, you know, uh, we will be sharing the slides as well as the uh, recording of the webinar in follow-up emails. And uh, like David said, uh, for any questions, uh, please do reach out to us. Uh, the contact information and the websites are uh, in front of you. And uh, once again, thanks very much. Uh, have a wonderful day or evening wherever you are. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.